Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. Welcome to One to One. It's hard to think of a job in New York politics or public service that the Honorable H. Carl McCall has not held. He served three terms as a New York State Senator, nine years as Comptroller of the State of New York, having been the first African American to be elected to a statewide office, was an ambassador to the United Nations, Commissioner of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, Commissioner of the New York State Division of Human Rights, and President of the New York Board of Education. He recently announced his retirement as chairman of the State University of New York's Board of Trustees and has assumed the role of Roosevelt House Leader in Residence at Hunter College. We'll discuss what drove him to pursue such a sustained career in public service, why he was so successful at it, and how he views the state of the state and the state of New York City at this point in history. Welcome. Cheryl, thank you. And reading that, it, I guess the conclusion is I just couldn't keep a job. <laughs> Your career has been long and impressive, but on the other end, there have been so many scandals that our elected officials have been involved in in recent memory. The leaders of both houses of the state legislature have gone to prison for corruption. Two attorney generals, one governor, and one comptroller forced out of office in various kinds of scandals. And a number of state senators and assembly members who have been forced out are convicted of crimes. And of course, you know what's happening in the Trump administration. Sure. Mm -hmm. Have we reached a new low in politics, or are things better than they seem? Well, I'm glad I didn't make that list. <laughs> so, uh, I think things are getting better, but they have been bad. There's no question about it that there's been corruption at the local level, the state level, the federal level. Uh, you know what happens? People get into politics, and there's a lot of power. There's a, there are a lot of things that they can do. They have access to all kinds of resources. And, you know, some people are just weak and they take advantage of that. But I think that the public has been outraged by this and people who even seem to be corrupt, or, you know, don't stay in office, they don't get elected. So I think it's changing. I hope it's changing because one of the problems now is attracting good people, particularly good young people, to politics because they see it as such an unseemly <laughs> profession. Uh, and, you know, money plays such a big part in, in politics. And if you want to be elected to office, you've got to raise and spend a lot of money. And there are always questions about raising money. Right. Because people give you money, and uh, there's an assumption that they're giving you the money because they want something. And then you're beholden to and them, then or you feel that to way. It's tough. But if you don't have money, you have to go to the public and uh, to get money. What is good, New York has a very good program, the best in the country, New York City, a program in terms of public financing for campaigns. That, that is helping the situation. The state hopefully is about to pass its own program. I hope it's as good as New York City's. And uh, I think that's one way to begin to change things. If you people are no longer dependent on uh, big donors, uh, and they get money from sources that are may, may be inappropriate. But if you're getting public financing, you don't have to do that. So I think that's a good thing. What made you go into public service and stay there for so yeah. long? Well, you know, and for me, it was a matter of giving back. I, 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 was a, I grew up in Boston, and I was raised by my mother, a wonderful woman who was committed to good education for her children. But... My mother raised me and five sisters all by herself. And uh, she really drilled in us the importance of education. She couldn't give us a lot of material things, but she gave us a sense of values and particularly to value education. And so I was able to go to college with scholarships. It didn't cost me any money to go to college and to go to graduate school. And I really felt that I was really obligated to reach back and provide the same opportunities I had to other people, to other young people. And I discovered having come to New York and worked in Brooklyn as a community organizer, working with churches in Brooklyn, pulled into public service. And I just thought this was an important way to provide opportunities to people. Because politics, whatever you think of it, this is where decisions are made. This is where decisions are made about how much money goes into certain communities. This is where decisions are made about how much money goes into education or health care or housing. So you have to be in that game to make a change. And I just 
was fortunate enough to have had the opportunities to get into politics and to important positions. And I hope I was able to provide opportunities and resources to people who might not have had them otherwise. You were elected to the state senate mm -hmm. with the backing of, well, it was Percy Sutton, you sure? the, mm -hmm. the, the Harlem Clubhouse. Yeah, yeah that's tri very important. Is Percy Sutton, David Dinkins, Basil Patterson, Charlie Rangel, they adopted me. Right. You know, they really enabled me to go into politics and they supported me in everything I tried to do. Is black political power in New York still centered in Harlem or has it moved no. or is it spread around? No. It's spread around. It, it, there's no question at one time Harlem was the political capital of the, of the country. And you had such outstanding people there, going back to Adam Clayton Powell and Ray Jones, and, and uh, then the next generation of Percy and, and uh, Charlie and David Basil. And uh, they were united. They really worked together. They supported one another. And they insisted that people who got into politics had the qualifications uh, to do the job. And so Harlem, therefore, was dominant. But now, you know, you look at the terrific people from, from uh, Brooklyn, like Hakeem Jeffries or Queens, Gregory Meek. So you can go around the whole state. I mean, and the fact that now in Albany that you have uh, Carl Hastie as the speaker of the assembly, and uh, then you, we have a woman, uh, Andrea Stewart Cousins, to be the head of the Senate. This is incredible to have that kind of power. Uh, black people, but they earned it. You know, there are some of us who were out there at front, and we had these opportunities, and we had to demonstrate that we could do the job. And that's so important now that when black people get into a position, they've got to demonstrate that they can do it and do it well, because if they do it well, the people who come after them will, will have opportunities. What was Albany like back in uh, when you were there? Yeah. Dull and <laughs> <laughs> segregated. And, uh, you know, I, I left because it was just, uh, you know, I was a, a Democrat in a Republican Senate and, you know, they didn't pay any attention to us. We just, uh, we just happened to be there. Uh, but we at least had Democrats in a um, Democratic majority in the Assembly and we've had good Democratic governors. But Albany was an interesting place, but it was still a place where major decisions were made that affected all of our communities. So you had to be there and you had to work at it. And you had to be there as an advocate for the communities and for the values and the issues that you thought were important. You talk about um, growing up a challenging childhood, mm -hmm. challenging but loving childhood, That's right. mm -hmm. uh, a single mom. Um, and you were able to go from there to Dartmouth, mm -hmm. an Ivy League yeah. school, and carve out a remarkable career. Um, Dartmouth had to be an interesting place it was. for you to be back in the 1950s. It was, it was very interesting. Um, when prior to the time that I applied to Dartmouth, they had a policy, a practice at least, of admitting four black students a year. So, I mean, just think about that, a statement. There are only four black men in, in America that they thought were qualified to come to Dartmouth. Well, the year I applied, they doubled it. It went to eight. That's how I made the cut. And it was quite an experience. But once I got there, it was interesting that it was clear to the, everybody at Dartmouth that we, the eight black students who came in, that we belonged there, that we, we, we had earned our way there because of our records in high school. And uh, therefore, there was full acceptance. And by the way, all eight of us graduated, and all of them went on to interesting careers. But, uh, you know, but the fact that we demonstrated that we could do it, and now maybe 100 <laughs> black students are admitted to Dartmouth because those of us who were there early, we, we, we showed that if given that, that opportunity. that was before affirmative action. That was before that affirmative, was before action. affirmative action. action, that's right. Mm -hmm. You left the state senate when Jimmy Carter appointed you to yeah. the U.S. delegation to the United Nations. Mm -hmm. I assume you're not one of those people who believes that the UN is just a huge boondoggle <laughs> where people from various yeah. countries come to hang out in luxury yeah. but don't get much done. A lot is done, just the programs all around the world. The problem is that here in the United States we don't see it. We see the people who are here, we, we you know, see them on television, but the programs and the activities in poor countries, in developing countries around the world, the UN plays a very important role. 
And the very fact that you do have some of the best and brightest people coming from countries all over the world, coming together, getting to know each other, working together, it's an important institution. And that's why it has uh, been here for so long and hopefully it will continue to be an important institution and it's important that the United States continues to support it. I think Trump is, Trump's kind of down on the UN, isn't he's he? He's down on everything, so you know, that's, he's, down on, he's down on the UN. Uh, uh, but I mean, he just doesn't understand international diplomacy and, and he has no clue in terms of the value of that institution. Like he, there are many other institutions that he doesn't have much uh, respect for because uh, he's not a person who's been involved in these institutions and, and has really learned how they function and why they're important. What do you consider your greatest accomplishment as a public servant? But just uh, being there in high positions, positions that have never been held by blacks before, and again, demonstrating that if given that opportunity, we could do that job. And the way I approached it is that I got in situations where I might uh, not know all of the things that had to be done uh, to make that organization function, such as the controller's office, where, for instance, uh, as the sole trustee of the state pension fund, I was responsible for managing a pension fund of $120 billion. But that $120 billion was there to provide benefits to thousands of retirees in the state. So it was a tremendous uh, responsibility to make sure that fund was managed well. So I did it by hiring good people, hiring good people who could do the job and supporting them in, in their activity so that they could in fact perform and do what needs to be done. So my, my, I believe my accomplishment in public service was to demonstrate that public service is important. It provides very significant resources and support to people who need it throughout the state and that we have to show that we can do it in an honest and ethical way and really uh, make the lives of people better. And you paved the way to a lot of black public servants. That's right. You know, I had young people who come, who came and worked for me and I gave them opportunities. I gave them mentoring and guidance and I'm continuing to do that. Um, I retired recently and upon my retirement, I use that as an opportunity to raise money. I ask people to come to my retirement party and to make contributions. And to date, we've raised about $260,000, which I will now use to provide scholarships to students from a couple of schools in Harlem who will now be able to go to one of the 64 campuses of the State University. And I will be able to give them not only a scholarship, but not myself and some other friends of mine will serve as mentors to those students. So I'm trying to continue that tradition of reaching out and helping young people just the way I had help when I was young. It made a difference for me. I hope it can make a difference for the young people who will be what we're going to call them as the McCall Scholars. Okay. <laughs> so okay. we hope they will have the same kinds of opportunities. We're going to take a short break, then we'll be back with Carl McCall, a 50-year public servant in New York State and the newly named Roosevelt House Leader in Residence at Hunter College. <music> Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy and I'm talking to Carl McCall, the newly named Roosevelt House Leader in Residence at Hunter College. Uh, we talked about, you know, what, what you feel are some of your biggest mm -hmm. accomplishments uh, as a public servant. What would you say was your biggest disappointment? My biggest disappointment was that <clears throat> I just saw so many people who had just given up on government and politics and just thought it was a terrible business to be in and they didn't pay any attention, they didn't provide the support that good elected officials needed. And so you ended up with people in high positions who got there just because they had money or they could raise money, but they weren't necessarily ethical, they weren't necessarily committed to the job. But it got back to just the public. I mean, one of the things that I, got me into politics in the first place was b doing voter registration campaigns. And we still are in a situation where we don't get the same 
turnout and same number of people voting in our black communities than other communities. Right. And that makes a difference because I like to say, you know, the money goes where the votes come from. So if you are, you're in a community and you're not voting, you're not participating fully in the political process, then, you know, uh, there are consequences. And, and they will uh, say, you know, what's the point? Yeah, what did it vote for? What point. difference will it <laughs> that's make? Right. I, that's changing, but it's been slow. But anyway, that was, that's what I w found disappointing during the course of my career, not being able to reach back and know that there, there was solid support there for the things that were really important for our community. Right. And, you know, <clears throat> I remember when um, South Africa had its first yeah. free election sure. and, you know, how yeah. important it was. And they, they allowed expatriates, people who had to flee yeah. the country yeah. and go other places, yeah. uh, to vote in those countries. Sure. And I remember yeah. seeing some who were voting here down by the United Nations yeah. and talking about all of the sacrifices they had made yeah. Mm. to have the right to vote. Well, look, right here in the United States <laughs> with the, this act Well, that's true. Young people don't realize what happened in the South in terms of the people who gave their lives uh, because they just wanted to register to vote. And I think, uh, you know, people today have to realize uh, that we had this tremendous outpouring of support and sacrifice on the part of a lot of people to make it possible for us to be in a better situation that we're in today. After you lost the governor's race mm -hmm. to George Pataki, and what year mm -hmm. was that? Uh, uh, 2002. 2002. Mm -hmm. You said one of the lessons you learned from that mm -hmm. was about the importance of raising money if mm -hmm. one sure. wants to succeed yeah. in elective politics. And it still is, and, but that's why, as I said before, I'm encouraged by the fact that we're trying to change that by having public financing. We have it in the city. The city of New York, to its credit, has the best public finance program in the country. And hopefully the state will catch up. They have a commission right now looking at how this will uh, play out in New York. And uh, that commission will make a decision uh, in the next uh, month. And that's very, could be very important. They've been, the state has been talking about campaign finance reform oh, oh, forever. Well, but this is the first time they actually done something. The legislature, again, the new leadership of Carl Hasty, Andrea Stewart Cousins with Governor Cuomo, they came up with a plan and the plan was to appoint a commission and give that commission the authority uh, to come up with a program and the legis that whatever they come up with becomes law unless the legislature immediately comes in and tries to undo it, which is quite unlikely. So I think we're gonna have campaign finance reform at the state level That'll bring more people into politics, and uh, I think that's good. As you said, you recently retired as chairman of the mm -hmm. Board of Trustees of the State University of New York. SUNY does not get the kind of press mm -hmm. or visibility, in New York City at mm -hmm. least, um, that CUNY does. I mean, I'm just wondering, why is that? And what should people know about SUNY that they yeah. don't know? <clears throat> well, what they should know is the largest public higher education system in the country that we have 64 campuses with a variety of programs uh, across the state. Uh, and uh, we uh, educate over 400,000 students. Uh, but many of our campuses are not in New York City. The campuses are all over the state and, you know, in Long Island, Central New York, uh, Western New York. Let me tell you, these campuses are so important in all those communities, not only because of the education that they provide, they're economic engines in those communities. Some of those communities in upstate New York, uh, the uh, SUNY campuses are the main employers, the main uh, investors in terms of the community. So SUNY is a very important institution, but it is upstate, so you don't, it's not in New York City at least, in such a significant way that, that, that you hear about it. CUNY is in New York City and we support it. We think CUNY does a great job in New York City and we try to look out for the rest of the state. One frequently hears complaints uh, around CUNY, certainly, mm -hmm. that, that CUNY gets shortchanged, uh, I guess financially, mm -hmm. whatever, compared to SUNY. Mm -hmm. Is there any truth to that? No, not really. SUNY gets more money because they, they have more campuses and more, more students. I mean, it's a proportional thing. First of all, 
none of us get enough money. So let's start there. So I'm, everybody gets shortchanged. Everybody gets shortchanged. That's right. We need to make a greater investment in uh, higher education. We, our investment in K through 12 is is considerable and significant. CUNY and SUNY lost a lot of money during the recession in 08, and they never really recovered. Today, it's not enough to have a high school education. You have to have a college education to get the kinds of jobs that are available and the kinds of jobs that will be available in the future. And that's what we provide at SUNY, and that's what is provided at, at CUNY as well. But we have to invest to make sure that we fulfill that promise that we've made to young people that we're going to give them an education so that they can have a productive career. This academic year, you assumed a pos the position of leader in residence mm -hmm. at Roosevelt House at Hunter College. Mm -hmm. um, tell me about your new job. Uh, Roosevelt House is a very unique institution. It's such an active place where they bring together speakers from all over the world, from all kinds of disciplines. It's a great place where people can come and, and learn about and participate in the activities that make New York the exciting place that it is. And so I'm there participating in their programs, helping to develop new ideas. But the main thing that I'm doing is I'm preparing myself to do something I've never done before, and that is to teach. I've never taught. That's amazing, that <laughs> That's all this amazing. time. That's right. So I'm going to teach a course next year. I'm working on it now. I'm next semester, rather, in the January semester, I'm going to teach a course at Hunter College on something that I've been involved in and I'm going to do it from the basis of my experience. I want to look at education and how it's influenced by politics and race. Uh, so I'm going to really look at how our educational system in New York City, our educational system in New York State, how they have uh, uh, flourished, but at the same time how they've been by been in a sense uh, stymied or or may put at a disadvantage because of how politics uh, impacts uh, education and how race impacts education. So that's going to be my course for next. What's semester. what's the title of your course? Education, politics, and race. Okay. What do you think is most needed among people, young people, older people? who are going into public service or who are seeking mm -hmm. elected office today? They, they just need just what you need for any career. You, you need to be disciplined. You need to be willing to work hard. You need to be able to understand and appreciate other people and differences between people and at the same time understand how even though we might have our differences, how we have to come together and find common uh, consensus in terms of getting things done. So it's a, it's a, it's a variety of difficult skills. But the, the same skills, you know, you need if you go into a corporate position, you know, or work for a nonprofit. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's an area where you have to have a certain set of skills, but the most important one is willing to work hard and willing to learn and willing to profit from mistakes. See, I, don't, I take the position there's no such thing as, an ex, uh, as a mistake or a failure. Uh, it's a temporary setback from which you learn so you can do a better job going forward. We got about a minute and a half left. Mm -hmm. I've not I noticed uh, that you are also an ordained minister. Mm -hmm. Why is it that so many black men who mm -hmm. are accomplished in other walks of life, law, business, journalism, medicine, academics, also ordained ministers? Well, because religion has meant a lot to us to, as a people and as individuals. For me individually, you, through my childhood, the church was so important. It made it possible for me to do a lot of things that I was able to do. I got a lot of support from, from my church and the people in it. And so that became part of my skill set. I mean, part of my my DNA was religion and believing in a God and believing in a just uh, society and having a responsibility to do something to make sure that we have equality. Uh, that's what I've tried to do, but that's a religious tenet that comes from the Judeo-Christian ethic that I have tried to follow. So uh, you can be a minister and, and, and have that commitment to religion in the church, and you can then be a lawyer, a teacher, and do a lot of other things. 
but I think it's a very essential and important ingredient that all of us ought to pay attention to and we ought to try to develop our faith because that's something that sustains us through all the difficulties that we face in life. Well, it's been a very rich and varied career that you've had, and I am very happy that you came and uh, shared your thoughts about it. Well, Cheryl, with us. thank you for uh, the interview, and thank you for your service in journalism, which is a, 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 a profession that has its challenges today. And uh, we really appreciate your professionalism, and I thank you for this conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Okay. We're out of time. I want to thank Carl McCall, a 50-year public servant in New York State and City, for joining me. For One to One and the City University of New York, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.